And okay, so I'm going to resume the recording. All right, gang, I'm so glad to see everybody on here and we'll see if our friends join us shortly. Let me just make this large. So seller pricing strategies. Now, I want to start the webinar just by saying that we're going to talk a little bit about what you need to do right now and then we don't know what's going to happen right you listen to the first webinar that Gary Keller led right after shelter in place was launched in like multiple cit cities and states and you know he was talking about how okay at family reunion at the you know keynote we talked about that we knew that the market right now is really strong but we are expecting a downturn and boom here it is right but then we get on the webinars every week with Tom and he's saying, guys, we're good. You know, we're expecting to be busy when we come out of this. We're expecting to have a strong close of the year, like get all your ducks in a row to do a massive amount of business. And we don't expect a downturn. Now, nobody knows, nobody has a crystal ball. So what do you then do as an agent? And, you know, I've been thinking about it and we're going to talk a little bit about it today is you want to be clear about the market that you're in, but also prepared for whichever way it goes. We're right now clearly in a seller's market and you want to be preparing yourself for as we move into a buyer's market that you know what to do. Because it really is one of those things where like, okay, it's a seller's market. And then there's like this gap and then it goes across to a buyer's market. We start to see the prices go down. And nobody knows when that gap, that jump is going to happen. So what usually happens is we start to see in, you know, everybody's wrong, things are going great. And then we start to see things sitting a little longer. We start to see the inventory go up. We start to see, right? And it takes a while for the pricing to catch up. And that is the gap. And so for a minute, it's going to be harder to get things closed or things, you know, are going to sit or your buyers are going to start to run into issues call if we do see a lending crunch happen, right? So we're going to have the conversation today really based on preparing ourselves for the future because, you know, we are lucky as a market center. We've got a lender who is updating us every single week about exactly what's going on. So right now what he's saying is, is you know what, we're good, but we wanna make sure that we're not shocked or unprepared for the if and when that day comes that this changes. So we're gonna talk about that today. So here are the main ideas, perspective on pricing strategies, studying your market, which is the most critical piece, I think, approaching sellers and then getting the right price and managing your listings in a buyer's market. So these are the five things we're gonna talk about on today's call. So perspective, here's what's, you know, really critical for people to understand is that when the market shift towards the buyer's market, the listings sit. Now, what is the one way you can really impact that as a listing agent? Who knows? I'll give you a hint. It's what today's webinar is about. Your pricing, guys. Yeah, in, in, right. in a buyer's market, having your deal well-priced is cr more critical than ever before. So it says here, in a buyer's market, real estate becomes a commodity. Well, what do they mean by that? What they mean is that in a buyer's market, there starts to be so much inventory that it's like it's just a house, right? There's so many options. There's, you know, so much opportunity. Um, it's, it's like a dime a dozen. It's not what it is in a seller's market where it's so competitive. There aren't that many houses. If you want to move into Baldwin Hills, like this is one of the five listings that are available. Like you've got to make sure that you play your cards right if you're really trying to get into a house up there. What happens in a buyer's market is like there's so many houses. It's like whatever, the, this house or the next house, there's just so many. Um, and you want to make sure that what that means is, is when there's so many houses, you've got to, as the listing agent, make yours more desirable and make sure that your pricing makes sense. In a seller's market, you can get away with 
overpricing your deal, not preparing it for market, having something that doesn't necessarily show well. Because the inventory is so tight, people are going to like go into that home looking for the potential. That doesn't happen when it shifts to a buyer's market. So, you know, price can correct a bad condition in a seller's market, but condition won't correct a bad price in a buyer's market. So that means that deal that really needs some work that you can just bring in an investor and it's not so far below the price of what the homeowner was hoping to get that you can still get that deal done at an investor's price point in a seller's market and a buyer's market. That's not going to happen. Those guys are going to want to pay so much less because the relist isn't going to be there that most of the time you're not going to have as easy of a time selling those broke down houses to investors. I want to make sure that this lands because we've got a lot of people in our market center that do those deals. And you want to make sure you're clear about this as the market shifts. The gap between what you're going to be able to get for a house that's like really nicely maintained or even renovated versus one that needs some work is going to be really big. And you've got to make sure you price accordingly. So correct pricing, you know, will actually be like 80% of your marketing effort. You could do everything under the sun. And if the price isn't right, your deal is going to sit. Does anybody have questions about this? Like about how you want to think about it? Yes. Really? Okay, go ahead, Heather. Well, um, so, I mean, I know it's gonna be a case by case situation, but right now I'm so nervous to counter back on anything. You know, um, I've got a, a deal where the buyer has submitted an offer and it's at, you know, just slightly above list price, but I know that we priced it just slightly under the market. Um, right. So I, I don't know. I'm nervous to, to counter back because I don't want them to go away and all the other things are there, you know, it's a great, uh, a great agent on the other side. Uh, the loan officer seems uh, responsive and knows what he's doing. Um, all the other things are there, but so here's, here's what I'll invite you to do. Cause we're actually going to go into this as we progress through the, through the um, slideshow is I invite you to go into the um, March closings and, and check. Cause usually we look at inventory and pricing inventory over a six month period. As we see the market start to shift, you want to start paying attention to what just closed. Look at what you can pull around you that just closed and see if you're still on. Cause you were saying like we price like just below, see if the things that just closed still have you at just below. Okay. You mean look at, where they started and then where they ended up. Well, I would just say, look at the most at the closings in, in March and see, okay, where are they closing on price per foot, right? Where are they closing on the metrics that you used to come up with the price that you went to market with and see if, well, when we went to market and when I pulled the comps, that had us just below market. And if you look at the last 30 to 45 days, with your current price, would you still be just below market based on those closings or would you be at market or would you even be maybe above where some of the stuff is closing today? Well, because things are so crazy, I'm also looking at what's available. So what's right. on market that's active that I can say, okay, for another three bedroom to bath in Lamert, everything else is priced this way and looks this way because you know, my, my house is not all white with, you know, mid-century modern uh, staging, it, you know, someone actually lives there and it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not on point, which is what I know the buyers are expecting it to be. So it's priced accordingly, but I got you. Yeah. But I think that's going to be the access is, is just like kind of ma managing the up-to-date statistics to see, okay, where are we today? Where are we today? Where are we today? And while you can look at the new listings hitting the market, why you want to be careful about that is that no other brokerage, I promise you, or very few of them are having this conversation. And a lot of people are going to still be pricing things with six months ago pricing through the end of this year, and then trying to figure out like, why is it sitting? Oh, yeah, I got it. Do you know what I'm uh, saying? 
like most people are going to just, you know, like, and that's what this is really going to kind of move into is just how data driven we're going to need to be so that you're not undercutting your people or putting yourself in a position where you can't sell it because the price is like wrong. Um, now it's going to take us a while to get there, but you still want to prepare for it, right? So, you know, when you look at what you're role is in the buyer's market is it we're coming out of a place where you know a, a house sold in a matter of days and agents were kind of like undervalued because they're you know there's just so much comp data and there's so much online and when things start to shift people are like you know they'll see that first you know few houses go with like price reduction price production and then go and then sit on market for x number of days and then go for however much below asking. And then that's when, um, you know, your clients are going to start to say, okay, wait, hold on a second. Like what's going on. And that is, that is like the key moment for the realtor to take hold is because in that gap where people can't yet understand and the comps are just starting to change and they don't really know what's happening. That's when you become really important and what you want to make sure that you're able to do is not give them your opinion, but you want to give them market knowledge and you want to use that market knowledge to inform pricing strategies that you're going to be able to roll out to people as you have conversations with them about upcoming possible transactions. And then you want to do the same thing if you're repping the buy side, right? You want to look at, you know, what you're seeing as you decide, okay, well, where do we want to come in at what price? What do we want to, um, you know, hold strong on and what do we want to be demanding around as far as terms. And then you want to also make sure these bottom three fiduciary commitment, knowledge of financing options and negotiation skills, that those are things that you're leading with so that they understand that now of all times, you really want somebody who's a professional to walk you through this. And I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I am going to give you an like aggregate, um, like a, uh, series of pieces in terms of information, right? So there's, here's the comp data. Here is the um, new listing pending data. Here is what I'm seeing personally in my transactions. Here is what we know on the financing side. And, you know, here is what I know works in a shifting market informed by like the conversations we're having here. You know what I mean? So you want to make sure that you understand what interest rates are doing and how that affects price and what you're going to need to do if you want to be able to capture buyers, right? If you're a listing agent, do you understand? So you're going to want to think from, okay, if we knew that we could push it and get this number six months ago and it would appraise, you want to make sure that you're up to date on that today so that with the new lending requirements, you're not going to have a problem when you get into that transaction when the bank comes back with their appraisal. You don't have to. You don't just have to. Oh, someone's got to go on mute. You don't want that one. Your kiddos. Here, let me mute it for you. Daddy? One second. They're so cute. <laughs> Sorry. Was someone going to say something? I think it was just Jay saying sorry. Oh, no worries. No worries. Okay. Um, I did want to, um, I did want to hire Vice Mahogany. Um, what you're describing, Nicole, really reminds me of how we had to kind of pivot or shift um, how we looked at the data when the market, with the uh, mortgage meltdown, 08, 09, and 10. And it did become, just like you said, looking at not like everything we had looked at before, okay, that's good information, but it, it really always came down to the data and the numbers and the most important numbers that mattered were the ones who were winning, either pending or closing. Right. That was the numbers that reign supreme over everything. And, and as long as you, cause you still have the emotion of the sellers that thought their properties were better than or worth more, but it came down to the data, not opinion, fact. And here's what she's really pointing to that I think I want to I underline is that, 
as you start to look at this and everybody should be doing this, you know, ongoingly and Brandon and I will put something together and we'll also share about it in our next team meeting. Um, but this is also going to be the ammunition you're going to use when you talk to people, because there are people who literally think they've got months and months and months if they were planning to sell and that they're going to be able to get that number no matter what. Now they might, nobody knows. But you want to at least have the conversation with people and say, look, you know, this is what we're expecting and, and use the data. Look at it. Either you can, you'll go on there and you'll see from, you know, um, February to March that the numbers look really similar. We're not seeing it. We're not seeing a bump in transactions falling out. We're not seeing a ton of price reductions, or you'll see that you are, or you'll look at where things are closing, same, you know, like property, like property, similar area, and you'll see a downtick or an uptick. And you want to be looking at that, calculating those percentages, writing those out, and, you know, having those conversations with the people in your sphere or your farm. And you could even create marketing around it. Um, because like we've said over and over, when the market shifts, the people who are market as experts are the ones who survive and thrive. And the ones who think they're going to get by by just sticking a sign out in the yard and answering the phone, it's going to get harder and harder to have deals if you're not doing the other things. The other big thing is, is, is prospecting. If you're not prospecting, you're going to run into a, a, a spot where there's just not going to be a pipeline and there are less deals to go around and it's going to be a little more competitive. People are going to go with the person who's been providing value the entire way through versus now you catch someone on the right day and they're willing to give you an opportunity. Before I move on, does anybody have questions about this? Okay. So what are the opportunities? You know, you, you as an agent obviously have the opportunity to take a little bit bigger role um, and provide a little more in this little gap as we move from one market to the other. I talked a little bit about that earlier because it's going to be a, more challenging for the average person to make sense of this data. So that's where you really have the opportunity to step up and provide a ton of value for people and, you know, you don't want to tell them what to do, but you want to give them enough like hardcore data that they're able to, you know, see the patterns and then make decisions. And then, you know, as far as opportunities for sellers, you want to be having the conversation where it's like, look, we are, you know, in a position where this could, could turn. And then you're not going to be able to get the number that I know we've been talking about. So we need to start having the tough conversations now and, and figure out if we were looking at a, six to 12 month timeline, do we want to move that up so that you can take advantage of this opportunity um, where the numbers still are what they are and we're able to, you know, um, get people money at this incredible interest rate. So this is, you know, what we've been talking about. You want to go and start having the conversations now and, and from a consultant role, so you need to first study your market and then pre-qualify your sellers. So what does that mean? That means you need to, we talked about this like two sessions ago, you need to figure out who is motivated and who isn't and not spend a ton, a ton of time on the people who aren't super motivated because as the market shifts, you're gonna need the people who really wanna get this transaction done to be the ones that you go to market with and the people who were like, you know, we can wait forever for the right buyer. That's probably not who you want to spend your time on right now. So you got to pre-qualify your sellers, find out who's motivated, find out why they're motivated, because you're going to need to remind them of that motivation if and when you hit roadblocks in the transaction and you need them to maybe like um, give a little on certain things when that request for repairs comes or what have you. And then the most critical piece is making sure that you come out with the right price and that you don't go to the listing table with your advice, but that you go with a hardcore data. Okay, let me show you the slideshow of this house. Let's look what we have here. Okay, and this is what this ended up selling for. And you want to go with the most recent stuff. Don't go with, you know, January's deals. Go with March's deals, February, right? Definitely not last year. 
And you want to, you know, let them know that as we go into a shifting market, the tired old listings, much harder to sell. So if we're motivated, which we are, because we're only working the motivated people, we're going to need to have, you know, a hardcore conversation about what the price is today. So be the local market economist. What does that mean? Does anybody know? Know what's going on in the local market area. Yeah, and not at a, not like on a superficial level. You know what I mean? So that means that you are on curbed on all of the um, like local real estate publications and you know what development is coming in. You know what new condos are coming to market or what's being built right. or what sh shop just got approved or where the new Whole Foods or Trade Joe's or whatever that's going to be is right. coming in and when it's going to come in. And, you know, um, you know, in your area, like how many homes are currently listed for sale and is that an increase or a decrease year over year? or even month over month and by how much, right? And you wanna know, you know, what's the average price per foot and what is it for a renovated flip? What is it for a well-kept, you know, owner occupied? What is it for an investment property with a tenant occupied? What is it for, um, you know, something that needs a lot of work? And you wanna be able to distinguish between those three. What are the average days on market? Right. And for those different categories, you know, how long is it taking for those to go pending in the MLS? And then you want to preview the properties because you want to understand as you compare those houses to whatever house you're repping the buy side or the sell side on that you're making apples to apple comparisons as you study this data and then communicate it to your client. So this is where you're gonna do that research, you guys. MLS, you all have MLS access and you have the opportunity to pull these statistics and pull these reports. And then you wanna look at all of it and then pick out the pieces that tell the story in a way that you can convey it to your client. So you don't wanna like, you know, throw so much at the average person that it doesn't make sense for them, but you wanna pick out, okay, of all this data, what are the ones that are moving or what are the ones that are staying the same that it would matter for people who are looking to buy or sell a home in that area that those numbers have stayed the same? Hey, you know what, you guys, we're still seeing that, you know, month over month, year over year, we're tracking pretty consistently as far as inventory or we're tracking pretty consistently as far as days on market. We're not seeing an uptick. We're not seeing, you know, deals fall out. We're not seeing a ton of price reductions. Like we're in a good position, right? And then can I, I, can I add something? Sure. Uh, um, just for, because there's so many newer agents um, in this discussion, what Nicole is describing in terms of the research, it doesn't mean that you're mining away every day. Like if you take the time to set up your MLS uh, landing page or dashboard with the elements of information that are critical, you literally can log in and say, oh, if every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is when you look, it tells you how many went on the market. All the all the um, points that Nicole is talking about, it just becomes set it up. So now you can just get the information easy and, and as readily as you need it. I just want to add that. No, I appreciate that. Um, we should do something, Brandon. Can we schedule so that we can show people where and how to do that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, That's I'll add something to the make the May calendar coming we'll up here. Do it. We'll do it um, on my Thursday. Class. We'll do it in the first oh, part. Perfect. Of adding something, we'll just do it then. And then you know, like we love having partners, and we're going to set up a more formal structure, but um, an opportunity like when we do our our um, scripts and dialogues is that'll be part of what you can log on and talk to people about, like what is the going to be the most effective messaging in terms of what those numbers look like and what we want to be sharing with people. And then, you know, like Mahogany said, you want to be using the MLS to track numbers in your client's price range. So that means if you've got, you know, a pipeline of people that are within a certain price range in a certain area, you can set it up so that you're seeing 
what's happening with those properties is they hit the market, go pending and close. And then you can be updating your database and your people ongoingly with like, Hey, you know, here's what we're seeing. Or you see a sudden dip. You're going to call that person and say, you know what? We just saw a drop. It's really time that we, we move up what we were planning as far as getting this house on the market, because I don't want the price to drop below what I know you need to be able to get into another property and let's rock and roll. So, you know, similarly, you want to take the shifting market into consideration when you're evaluating the comps. We talked about that. You don't want to go back too far and you want to make sure that you're tracking the story as things are kind of ebbing and flowing with what's happening with COVID that we're paying attention to the newest market data um, and setting up our sellers to win. And then you wanna get the big picture. So what's gonna start to happen is as we start to see prices drop in different areas, people who, you know, Heather gave a great example, were like hell bet on Lamert. Oh my gosh, I have to be over that's where I want to live. That's the only thing I want you to show me. But then let's say West Adams starts to have killer deals. People are going to want, are going to be willing to chase that deal and move to a different area. So you want to also keep that in mind on the list side that, you know, if you are one of the last of the party in terms of following that flow of the pricing as it goes up and possibly, well, it's not going to go up, but as it starts to come down, there are people who would have been candidates for your property, but they're just going to buy elsewhere. And you want to make sure that you also have that conversation. So what do you need to do then is track around you. If somebody can go just a few streets over into another part of town, and now they've just saved, I don't know, $30 a foot on the deal. You want to make sure you understand that. Now that might not mean that your seller is going to, um, say, okay, let's change the price today. But remember, you're being a consultant. You want to make sure you're giving them the information and then allowing them to powerfully choose. It also has whatever the results be as you go through the shifting market, not necessarily be, you know, it's hard if you're just trying to advise someone and then their heels are dug in. It's very different if you say, hey, here's what's going on. And I wanted to show this because you might want to consider this chain regards to price. And then they say yes, or they say no. And then they come to you maybe day 25 and they say, you know, Hey, Brandon, we still don't have any offers. What's going on. And then you can say, well, yes. And if you remember, I showed you this data and I mentioned at this point that we should have done something with the price and we haven't. And now we're seeing the result of that. Maybe now we want to make that change. What are your thoughts? Does anybody have questions about this? Breaking up a little bit. Oh, how about now? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, but your video is uh, hmm. freezing. It is. Okay, let me see. I'm going to move and see if this helps. Of the exit wall. I will. Okay, sorry guys. No. Uh, Nicole? Yes. What I had to do, cause my, uh, we're in mitigation with my property on Cardiff and my client is still animate about trying to get the 1.9 uh, sales price. So I met with her daughter, um, Izzy's myself and met with her daughter and we asked her to go back to her accountant because she's feeling that, you know, she's 88, she has to have this amount of money to live. And so we put it back on, on the accountant to see what would be the best thing. Because right now we're looking at 1.7. 1.7 is not sitting that well with the family. And so they're, they're wanting to get the house ready to rent and then maybe come back later and put the house on the market um, after things go up. So, well, I would definitely do some data analysis on that and see if that makes sense. If you see that, um, you know, there is still an inventory crunch over there and you think prices are going to hold, I would 
maybe consider doing that. But otherwise, if you're starting to see reductions, days on market go up, people starting to drop prices, you might want to tell them, listen, if you guys are trying to get out of this property any time in the near future and you don't do it now, you might be at a lower number a year from now. Okay. And I don't know if you remember, it took 10 years to come back from the 08 prices. Mm -hmm. It's a long time. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, so they're trying to get a loan to pay off the, um, the mortgage, the uh, reverse mortgage. They're trying to do their own thing. And he's, he's and I, you know, I mean, I'm still reaching out. There's a couple people who expressed interest. So I'm still doing my piece about asking people to come and reconsider, you know, looking right. at the property. So well, yes. I think doing exactly what we were talking about earlier, where you just, you know, go into the MLS and pull some new data, see what happened last month over there. Yep. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So one of the things that you're going to be able to do is, um, you know, pull formulas and graphs and use visual aids to show your sellers. And for that matter, even your buyers, what's going on in the market. And you want to practice before you do it in front of them so that you are able to explain what you're visually trying to display to the client. But people often, when they can see it, um, it's faster to internalize and mentally understand what you're saying versus when you just try to have a conversation. And I would even say this when it comes to doing the comps and, and laying them out, you know, not a ton of information, but you know, creating some sort of a visual display that really shows people like, okay, this is where we're at. So this is how you want to understand what the activity index means. It's the number of properties going under contract compared to the number of active properties plus pendings in the market. So that's going to tell you, like, it's basically telling you what percentage of all of the available property activity, meaningful activity. And then obviously, if that percentage is higher, things are looking good. And if that percentage is lower, not so great. And then the absorption rate, which is how we determine how many months of inventory you have on the market. So it's basically saying how long it would take to sell all of the available homes if no other homes were to come on the market. And why we care about that number is as inventory increases, price typically falls. So these are going to be the two things that as you do your data research, as we move through the shelter in place and then come out of it at whatever speed we do, you're going to be running these statistics to start to give you an inkling as to, okay, when are we kind of reaching that seller's market peak, heading into that gap between where we go down in price on the buyer's market. So to calculate that, you take the number of active homes on the market and you divide it by the number of homes sold in the last 30 days. And that's your absorption rate. So if, and on this one, if that number is smaller, right, that means we've got more inventory and that means we're heading from a seller's to a buyer's market. Because why do we call it a seller's market? We call it that when there's not that many houses, it's super competitive. Every time you go on the buy site to write an offer, you're competing against five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 people, right? And when it's a buyer's market, it's like, well, there's tons of houses, maybe not that many qualified buyers. And now we're in a situation where prices are starting to fall and you're having to make sure you're priced right and the things look good so that you can attract as many buyers as possible because there aren't as many as there were before. Does anybody have questions about these before I move on? No. We'll send you, Brandon, will you, I'm gonna forward this to you. Will you add this to the Google Drive we have for Ignite so everybody can pull this up and look at it again? But I just want to underline why we're talking about these two numbers is that this is part of what you're going to look at ongoingly month after month to see, you really don't need to do these calculations more than every 30 days to see if we're starting to see the conditions that tell us as realtors, oh, okay, we're starting to shift from that seller to that buyer's market. Okay. All right. 
So this, we've already said this, you wanna create graphs, you can use Excel. We as a market center are gonna support you with some of that. At International, they actually send us things that we can put in the data and then it'll spit out the graph and Brandon and I will get you more information, but we're gonna upload this at the very least so that you can do the math and then be able to have those conversations. Here's an example of this is, you know, what it looks like new listings and sales. So what can you see from this graph? Like if you were gonna sit across from a seller, right? And you were gonna show them this graph, what, are you, what, what, what would you say about this to that person? It looks like inventory is pretty high compared That's to- That's right. Sales. That's right. So if you're sitting across from that person, Rasson, and they're like, I know that you're telling me it's only 358 a foot, but I want 400. I want 400. My number is 600,000. It's got to be 400. And then you put, and then you say, okay, Nicole, I got that. I understand. And then you lay down this graph. Then what do you say? Here's the thing, right? Look at this. Here's the data, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the inventory is so high that if we actually want to sell your home, coming out over the market price today, we're not going to get that done. And you said that you wanted to get into a bigger home because you guys were on top of each other here. And you got to remember that if you're not selling for 400 a foot, neither is the property you're going to buy. Everybody's values are down. So you're really not losing here since we're going into another deal or whatever you say. But can you see how having that conversation with this piece of paper on the table at the kitchen table has that conversation go a totally different way with the seller? It does, right? Good. So this is why we're going to use pretty, pretty pictures. Okay, so we've already talked about this. For sellers, you can only, oh, well, you can only afford to work with the very motivated because as the market shifts and people have to start to confront, confront the new prices, um, it's gonna be, I don't wanna say tough because that's just made up, but if you, it's not gonna be possible to get these deals closed in a timely manner if we don't find the motivated people because those are gonna be the people who are going to be willing to confront the changes in the market and are going to behave accordingly and allow you to do what you need to do as a listing agent to get the property sold. So you've gotta pre-qualify these people before you go ahead and sign a listing and then start paying for staging and all of and photography and all of these different things that we as agents pay for when we're bringing a property to market. So you're going to want to do these two things and figure out for yourself who's going to play ball. I'm not saying, now I'm not saying if someone's not, that you don't want to stay in touch with that person or do business with that person, but you want to make sure that you make the right choices about that. Somebody who is willing, who wants to go to market like 20% over what you know is the, is the actual price. Are you going to pay for staging for that home? No. You're not. I would even consider not taking the listing. I just don't necessarily, you know, think that that's the way to go at this point. You want to keep people in your web because we work so hard to get them into our web, but you want to be smart about the decisions you make as you move forward. And then here's the other thing, guys, it's going to be tough, but it's critical to tell the truth. And, and I don't mean tell the truth, like convince them of something. I mean, come there with the data, with the graphs, with the printout of what's going on in the market from the MLS and say, listen, I, I'm going to sit here, Sandra, and I'm going to tell you, this is what's going on. Boom. Lay it out on the kitchen table and say, I know this is what we want. And I know that you're super motivated to sell this home. How do I know that? Because I've pre-qualified her and I only work with motivated people. So given that we're trying to get this done, this is what's going on in the market. And based on this, this is what we need to do. So you wanna, you wanna do it from a place that you care about them, right? Not beating them up like this is what it is and I need you to see my point of view but like, I want what you want. And for us to have what we want, we need to look at this information and then I'm gonna give you the information and then now we need to make some decisions, okay? So you wanna be strong, you wanna be upfront, you wanna get them to come out at the right price. And then you wanna use data. So back up the, your, your conversation with, 
data from the MLS, news stories. Um, I know that I've asked um, Tom to start creating some things that we can use like marketing wise and take with us like one pagers on what we're seeing happening and um, as far as the finance side goes. And you wanna leverage all of that so that you're not asking them to take your word for it, but you're actually giving them your professional opinion based on here's all this information I've gathered because it's my job to gather it. Does that make sense, you guys? Yes. Do you guys hear the difference? If I can add to, um, Miles and I have been working on updating my website. You know, these sellers are going straight to your website to see who you are and what you're doing. And um, if it doesn't look like you're in business, then they will pass you over. So we've been working on that as well. Yep. And also, you know, putting different articles and things where you can put, find out more and, and have a call to action so that people can put in their data and raise their hand to find out and get their, find out more information and get their questions answered by you. A qualified market expert. Really good. So you also want to listen for responsiveness as you have these conversations. So you need to see if, as you have this conversation, if that person's going to dig their heels in, probably not the deal for you guys. This is somebody who every step of the way, if they're like not willing to listen to you on price and they're not willing to pay attention to the data, they're not willing to do what they need to do to get the house ready because back in a seller's market, we could put down, put up this broke down house with the things falling down and people would still buy it. But this is now a buyer's market. It's got to be in good condition and they're refusing to fix, you know, the hole in the wall or take out the mildew piece of wood that's like at the front of the property. Like you've got to pay attention to those things and let that inform whether or not it's going to be a listing that you want to take. And some sellers might not be able to face reality and they're not going to be able to list their home at the price that's actually going to get it sold. And you don't want to end up spinning your wheels with these guys because there are going to be other people that are motivated and are going to listen to the data and be willing to play ball. So there's going to be a bit of shifting that we're going to most likely have to do as we move into the seller's market. So you want to make sure that you're doing that pre-qualification and you're doing that interview. So people know, well, not you people, but you know what people, um, what their motivation is and whether or not they're going to um, be able to do a deal in the market. That so we've talked a little bit about this. You're going to want to make sure that you're able to speak effectively and clearly about the data that we pull. So we're going to have different scripts that are going to be around presenting the MLS data. And you're gonna wanna make sure you polish it and we're gonna have you know, our, um, our two calls a week where you're able to practice that. And if you're not getting on it, even if you're somebody who's been doing this for 20 years, you still don't wanna practice on your customers. You still wanna jump on that call, role play with a buddy, make sure you're like, okay, good. I just wanna make sure like I have it down and I'm not gonna be fumbling. And that when somebody asks me a question, where did, what does this mean on the graph that you actually can explain it and, and have a deep understanding and know the answer? This is a little redundant. You also want to, um, in addition to cracking scripts and dialogues, you want to make sure that you are listening. You want to make sure that the sellers experience that it is a consultant partnership and relationship. So that means that you're not when, you know, when they're saying, okay, but I need this number, you actually have to listen to that and, and address it in your response. Sometimes you might even need to say it to them up front. You might need to say, hey, Rasong, I know you were expecting 400 a foot. And I know you're going to be disappointed that this is now the number. And I know this changes our plans. And this is where we are. And then be quiet and let them talk. And then you've got it, you know, kind of be like, I think it was kind of, I don't know if it was on like the phone show. We were talking about this. kind of have to like be their therapist or to that. Nicole. Yes. Quick question. Can you go ahead and can you just mute Sahara's mic? I think she's doing something and not realizing the noise. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> there we go. So we just talked about this. You want to address objections before they come up and send out a thorough CMA in your pre-listing package. What does that mean, a thorough CMA? 
This is just more of what we've been talking about, giving them ample data to support the conversation you're gonna have. And then exactly what we said, bring up their objections yourself and then sweep them away. What does that mean? That means you wanna acknowledge what you know is already there and then you know, um, basically resolve it for them and you in that conversation right? Like for that person that's like, oh my gosh, but I'm not going to be able to get into a new house. Listen, I know Heather that you need to get into a new house and that we're now pricing your house lower than you were expecting. Whatever house you go into is also going to sell for less than what you thought you were going to pay. So we're right where we always were like that. Got it. Okay, cool. So get into the right price guys you don't want to miss the window of opportunity in the past it was there were opportunities for you to put up a listing take it back down reprice it do a price reduction when the markets shifted you lose those opportunities and if a buyer believes a house is poorly priced they're going to pass it by why are they going to do that who knows why because they have options that's right that's right. So, you know, and there's going to be a lot of new stuff coming on ongoingly. So once people give it a look and they feel like, oh, this one's in bad condition next, or this one's not priced well next, it's going to be harder for them to turn their eyes back toward your deal because there are so many other deals and new ones happening all the coming on all the time. So you get your one shot and you want to make sure that you set yourself up and you set your seller up for success, you had to price it well and, you know, bring it to market right. So, you know, allow your sellers to self-discover by asking some of these simple questions, right? You want to, you want to, um, like show them all the comps and then say, looking at all the comparables here in the MLS for your neighborhood, how much would you be willing to pay for your house if you were a buyer today? right? And, and show them this is what people are paying. This is what this one went for. That's like, <laughs> you know, walk them through. Here's the kitchen. Here are the bedrooms. Look, this one's got a pool. This one's got a yard, right? And then say, okay, so this one just sold for this amount. Let's look at your house, right? Like what would you say yours should go for? Right? So we used to ask that question um, before, but not inside of looking through all of the other deals you want. And you know, this is another one. Perfect. Given what I've shown you about the market, what do you think your house will sell for? Or look, what do you think we need to do? Here are the numbers. Okay. Well, maybe I might need to do something about this kitchen before we go to market. And I'm willing to do that and able to, to do that now. Does that make sense? You guys? Yes. Cool. Yes. So, okay. Uh, quick question before you move on. Do we still have the program for sellers to do work um, prior to um, going on the market and then they pay through escrow? There was some program we had. No, every brokerage has now frozen that program. Sotheby's, ah. Compass, everybody, everybody has Got because it. of what's happening right now. Now there are people, agents, like I know of agents who were doing it. They were financing it themselves. Even those people have paused on that. Why are we pausing on that? Because there's so, we don't know what's happening right now. And if there was volatility that then made it impossible for us to get our money back, we would be out of luck. Makes sense. Red yeah. light, green light. <laughs> yeah. So that's why the, those aren't happening right now. So here we go. Tell the tale of two markets in a seller's market. What do you guys see about this graph that you could be above or below the average comp. You could be great condition all the way to poor condition and you're in the market. It's a big chunk of that wedge, right? Do you guys see that? That very little, I mean, you've got to be like either in Rick, you guys see my mouse? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so you've got to be like in really bad condition or you've got to be so overpriced that people are like, nope, can't touch that deal, right? And when I say you're, you know, you're, um, you know, you're, and even over here, it's like you've got to be in really bad condition and not priced accordingly, you know, but you can be in pretty bad condition and still kind of expensive and be over here and you're still going to get that deal sold. And you could be, you know, coming out of the tip top of the highest comp and you might still get it done. 
right? You stay on the market long enough, enough things sell that were competitive and had seven, eight, nine, ten offers in a month or two. Now the comps have hit where you came out to market and were technically overpriced 30 days earlier, right? Now, then we get into a buyer's market and this is what happens that you've got to be really well priced and you've got to be in really great condition because there's so much inventory that all of these other deals that are too expensive and not in good condition are out of the market. No one's looking at them. They're not trading. Do you guys see that? Yes or no? Does everybody understand what I'm showing you? Yep. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Good. I understand. And then, yeah, okay, good. Well, cause I want to make sure, cause I'm not saying it for myself. <laughs> I want to make sure that it's landing with you guys. And then this is, and then this is kind of what it looks like on the way from here to here is we have this that out of the market gets bigger and then pushes over here into this kind of like no man's land where it's like, you know, these are the ones that are like, they're going to trade, but it's going to take some time. And it's like price reductions by the hair of your chinny chin chin. You were like, it was like, oh, thank God. Like you finally had somebody who was like, I'll take it, you know? And then these are the ones that are like, we're rolling. We're getting these sold in, you know, 35 days or less like that. And this is where you want to be. But if you aren't pricing yourself well, you struggle and end up out here in the yellow. And then no man's land is just a struggle because, you know, you're at least in out of the market, you can kind of prepare your client for it. Like they know that, look, we're, we're, we're really reaching here. We're not going to really see much. It's when you're here in no man's land that it's like, you're, you're the one who messed it up as far as they're concerned. Do you guys have questions about this? No. Do you see why it's really critical to find the right clients and get them to price it right? Yeah, so to move quickly. Because what you're going to have is the inventory is going to, remember how we told you there was still going to be a ton of inventory? Right. But this is what it's going to look like. And you have a small window for error. And Correct. Having to correct yourself, you end up putting your people in a really bad position. You have Especially. to be pricing and stuff. So you don't have, you have a small margin for error. That's right. That's right. And that's what this graph is really showing. Does anybody have questions about this before we move on? No. Aren't the visuals good? I love visuals. Okay, so there, um, you know, we have a Google, we have a Google Drive that has all of the student manuals. So if you guys go on to the Google Drive and you open the number seven student manual, there's a chart on page 30 that you'll fill in. And this is what you're going to, this is the activity that you want to do. And you want to look at, okay, what would it be? What would the numbers be? for the ones that you're looking at on the MLS that are in, out, and no man's land. And then look at those deals and given the data, figure out what would the prices have to be for those no man's land and out of the market properties to be in the market. And it's really just an exercise to get your mind around, okay, like what, because it is, it's different pricing this way. So this is like an exercise designed to get you to stop and think about, okay, what, what has to change from how we're doing it today to do it the way we're going to need to do it then. And the other two calculations I gave you are the things that we're going to use to determine, okay, when do we need to move to this? Cause it happens pretty quickly. So, you know, the law of supply and demand when pricing their home, sellers need to obey the law. So this is what we were just talking about. A market which has more buyers than sellers is a seller's market. So high prices result out of this excess demand over supply. There aren't that many houses. They all start going over asking 10, 12 offers per house. People just going up, 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 up in price. And then now that comp hits and then here is, and then you have enough of those. Now that's the new baseline. And that's what houses go for in that neighborhood. Now, in a buyer's market, there are more sellers than buyers. So now people are like not competing for the deals and they're going to go for the one where they can get the most value for their money, which is 
like that happy mix between condition and price. And that starts to be the new standard because there's an excess of supply over demand, which is why we need to get the price right on these. So you want to stop and think, how can you use the ML statistics to explain the effects of supply and demand in your market? Well, you can use just the two numbers that we talked about here, right? Is number of listings, right? Versus closings, right? Or what we did, which was active plus pending divided by pending, that number, you look at it from one month over to the next month and that will start to tell you, are you in, are we in the seller's market and holding strong? Or are we and still in the seller's market, but moving toward that buyer's market? Let me see who's messaging me on chat. Oh, so we'll probably be done, Sandra. I don't know. I mean, we've got like five more slides. There we go. So what you want to make sure that you do is that you don't chase the market. You want to price your listings ahead of the market. Look at the writing on the wall and make sure that you're right there in the pocket. So it's kind of like Ma Mahogany said is you don't want to, you know, lose your shot when you like up front and be last to the party. So if you are, you know, in the, we know we're heading into the buyer's market. Don't stay at that super high seller's price. Do what Heather appreciates. She said she just did on her um, Lamert listing. Go right, right just below. Come in right just below. If you see that it looks like we're headed down. Nobody's asking you to give away the farm, but you don't want to be way up, way up top when really we're, we're on the way down. So here's what you have to do as far as managing your listings in a buyer's market. You need to increase the frequency of communication. If you are a listing agent that doesn't like to answer the phone, takes forever to return email, doesn't respond quickly to showing requests, you are going to have a problem when we move into a seller, into a buyer's market, because there are so many deals. They are going to move on to the next one. And then you're going to want to increase their frequency and unique timing of open houses. Right now with our given circumstance, if, you're, if you have a listing, you should for sure for every single deal be doing Matterport, um, like virtual tours and video and all kinds of um, virtual like marketing that allows people to feel like they're in the house. Um, Rasone, for those of you that don't know, has all of this equipment and offers a really competitive price for our agents and our market center specifically. You guys call him, take advantage of this. You, you're going to want to make sure that you take those steps as you bring things to market right now because we're still in shelter in place for at least what, Brandon, we, do we have four weeks left? Four weeks. It's a long time. And then, you know, you're going to have to eventually get price reductions if you come out and we see that things are moving faster than we thought. Now, these are going to be the three things that you're going to want to use as you have that conversation. As you obviously, I think the most important one is your strengthening relationship with your seller. You've got to make sure that person trusts you, knows that you care about them, and knows you can get the job done. And then you want to use time and you want to use it aggressively. Don't wait until it's so far gone. You guys like have the conversation. If you come to market and in seven to 14 days, you're not seeing any action. You got to have a conversation with them so that you, you know, time is of the essence and use your market statistics and all of those conversations. Like, so it's not just your advice or your premonitions. It's actually like, here's the data. And this is what we need to respond to as soon as possible. And then, you know, you also can do it up front. You can schedule them. Hey, if we get here and we haven't gotten sold on day 21, we're going to do this reduction. On day 30, we're going to do this reduction, right? And then you want to make sure that you also set yourself up in the beginning for possibly having to carry this listing for some length of time. So, that means if you're signing up for marketing things that cost money, that you are not doing something that's so expensive that you can't afford to do it after day 30. Same thing with your staging. So you need to keep, you know, costs low and make sure that you are um, 
having a timeline that you've set up with your seller so that you guys know if you're on track or not. And if you get to a point where you guys know, okay, if we're now at this number and that's still not the number, we're not going to be able to do this. And that you have that up front and that you can know when the writing's on the wall that like, we're probably not going to be able to get it done if this is my seller's bottom and this is where the comps are. And you got to have those tough conversations when the time comes. So you want to, Create desire for your listings, you guys, by marketing well-priced and staged properties is coming soon. Now, we're going to have to have a conversation with Mike Berlin because obviously there have been some changes about how we're going to have to do this, but I wanted to just make sure that for those of you who never do this, as we figure out what it looks like to do it, it's going to be a tool we're going to want to use as we move through the end of the year. And this is going to be like the steps, Okay. And then we're gonna at some point wanna make sure that we're able to offer seller concessions if necessary. So you wanna make sure that you understand what those are and can be. Tom is someone that you can work with on the loan side who could talk to you about what could some of those things be. And then you keep them in your back pocket so that if you need them as we move forward, and we're gonna also talk about this in Shift Tactic 10, but this is a resource that you have to try to make your deals look more desirable as it gets more competitive with more listings. And then, you know, the biggest thing is going to be price. Like I told you, when there's a ton of houses on the market, people are going to start to look at where they can get the most bang for their buck, where it's a combination of being where they want to be or near where they want to be a well, um, and a, a property that's in good condition that's well-priced. So let the numbers do the heavy lifting with your sellers, guys. Arm yourselves with graphs and data so that you can explain it as you sit across from the, at the listing table. And then everybody, you guys are going to want to jump on and create an action plan, especially my listing agents on here, so that when the time comes, because we are not there now, but you want to know so that when the time comes, you have a game plan and you're not at square one trying to figure it out on the fly. You want to know that you've done that work and you're, you know, armed and ready to go. And then here's what's coming up, you guys. We are going to do creating urgency to buy next. And uh, before we sign off, does anybody have questions? No. Was this useful? Yes. Yes. This is very useful. Thank yes. you. It helps me out of my situation. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you for joining me today and investing in yourselves and your businesses. I love you all. <laughs> I'll see you Nicole. there today. Aww. We love you back. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.